Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. I'm JC Cannon. I'm a SQL compliance strategist. However, I was recently in the corporate privacy group and I hosted a lot of these speakers that were so happy and lucky to get to come to Microsoft. Lori Crane is the last one that I am actually going to be representing. The external privacy research program is now going to be turned over to Brendan. Brendan Lynch. He's our director of privacy strategy and corporate privacy group. If you go to our MSR privacy website on MSR or through the privacy site, you notice a list of researchers we have that are internal and external to Microsoft. And of course, once again, we're fortunate to have, well, let me list the ones that are internal first. So this shows all of our privacy researchers, internally, their names with their email addresses, their department, what they link to their department information, and then a link to their personal site that's on research.microsoft.com. And there's also a list of external privacy researchers, and I did get their permission <coughs> before posting their public information or personal information. And there is Lori. That looks like Lori. So if you want to converse with her, you can just click on her email address and send her an email and say, hey, what's up with P3P these days? One of the most important things to know about Lori is she is the mother of P3P. She also wrote the book on P3P, which is still for sale. I think Corporate Privacy Group still has a few copies, signed copies left. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Lori for participating all these years, not only in this privacy research program, but our Trustworthy Computing Academic Advisory Board. Laura, if you could come up and accept this award. Thank you for your support for all the years. Thank you. Yeah. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lori Craner. Well, thanks. Um, and thanks to uh, all of you who came in early this morning. Uh, sorry for 9 a.m., but I have a 1 p.m. flight to catch back to the East Coast, so that's why it had to be that way. Um, Um, so, uh, before I um, launch into the main part of my talk on privacy, I just want to tell you a little bit about the lab that I have at CMU and some of the things that we're doing. Um, so, I started when I got to CMU about two and a half years ago, the CMU Usable Privacy and Security Lab, known as CUPS. And uh, we focus on usability issues in both privacy and security systems. Um, I have a number of students and other faculty who are working together um, with the lab. And uh, there's a book which I um, co-edited with Simpson Garfinkel last year, which uh, we, uh, came out recently, on security and usability. And it has um, uh, papers from about 60 researchers in the field. Um, so some of the things that uh, my lab is doing right now. Um, so we're doing a lot on privacy policies, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, we're also doing uh, work on a project we call Supporting Trust Decisions. And here we're looking at the kinds of uh, trust decisions that the typical user is asked to make on a regular basis. So I get this email, it has an attachment, should I open it? Um, the email says it's coming from my bank, is it really from my bank? Those sorts of decisions and we're focused on the human aspect of it and what can we do so that the users are not fooled by things that, that are trying to get them. Um, we're also looking at privacy and usability in pervasive computing environments. Um, and uh, one of the uh, things we have going right now is this phone that I have, I can use to actually unlock the door to my office. Um, we have Bluetooth door locks, and we have this whole crypto system where we um, have to uh, demonstrate to the door with a proof that it is allowed to open. Um, the credentials are, are passed with the phones. Um, what's really interesting is not so much that I can get into my office this way, but that 
um, a student could be standing outside my office with their phone and I'm here, they could SMS me and say, can I get into your office? And I could decide to let them in just now or for the next day or for the next week or whatever sort of credential I want to send back to their phone so that they could get in. Um, so we're, we've been looking um, at the the, uh, the usability aspect of this, and uh, you know now that most of the crypto work is done, how do we set this up so that you know my secretary can understand how to use this? Um, and we're also looking at use cases for the system, and we we right now have. Um, about 18 people in the building who have these phones and have access to it and uh, we interview them on a monthly basis and we notice things like sometimes it's easier to just hand somebody your phone than to go through this whole SMS thing and what can we do to make it so that they'll actually do what they're supposed to do. Uh, anyway, so we're having fun with that. Um, uh, and, and that's uh, us related to the smartphones. We're, we're, the other um, uh, thing that we're doing with, with the phones is uh, friend finder uh, loca location uh, tr finding services, um, but trying to focus in on how can I actually control the privacy aspects of it. So, you know, sometimes I'll allow people to find me and sometimes I won't, and I'd like to set up rules for doing that, but I don't want to spend hours writing privacy rules. So, how can we make this all work uh, seamlessly? Um, and uh, we're also looking at usable anonymity tools. Uh, so we've been working with, there's a Tor anonymity system, which the Electronic Frontier Foundation is sponsoring. And uh, they had a contest to develop a graphical user interface for it. Um, and so we had a team of students and faculty work on that. And we, we won the first round of the competition. So here we all are with our Tor t-shirts on um, after that. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about privacy today, and I assume most of you are here because you already have some interest in privacy, but just in case you need some, some, a testimonial as to the importance of privacy, Brittany Spears um, let us all know a few weeks ago, um, so she says that you have to realize that privacy is one of these things we all need as human beings. Um, so, now you're convinced, right? <laughs> Uh, all right, so if we need privacy, um, uh, then we need privacy policies, right? Well, um, no, the, um, the idea behind privacy policies was that this is a way that companies can communicate about their privacy practices uh, with people. And particularly on the internet, companies are communicating about their, their online privacy policies. And so when you go to a website, the theory is, is that you can find out what data they're, what they're going to collect, what they're going to do with it, um, and you can make an informed decision about whether you want to interact with a particular website. That's the, the theory anyway. Um, there's some other things about privacy policies which are useful. So in the United States, where we have minimal privacy legislation, the fact that we have a privacy policy makes companies subject to regulation by the Federal Trade Commission because the Federal Trade Commission is allowed to regulate for fraud and deceptive practices. So as soon as I put up a policy and say, this is what I'm going to do, then if I fail to actually comply with my own policy, it's fraud. And then the FTC can come after me, not because I violated a privacy law, but because it, of, of the fraud um, <coughs> issue. So, so the Federal Trade Commission um, at the end of the 1990s was um, uh, really trying to twist the arms of lots of companies and say, you have to put up these privacy policies. Um, and um, somewhat amazingly, I think um, most of them did. So uh, they went from you know, almost nobody having website privacy policies to something like 95% of commercial websites having privacy policies in the course of just a few years. Right. But there are a lot of problems with privacy policies. Um, people find them very difficult to read. Um, people find them difficult to understand. They're long. They're time consuming. And then you finally get through. You've read this whole long thing. You think you figure it out. And there's this line that says it's subject to change without notice. So you wonder, oh, do I have to do this again every time I come back to this website? Um, and so uh, they're somewhat problematic. and. Um, uh, at the end of the day, we find out that although people say they like privacy policies and they get warm, fuzzy feelings about websites because they see that link that says privacy policy, almost nobody actually reads them. Um, and so um, from the perspective of, of informing consumers, they turn out to not be very effective. 
Uh, so the World Wide Web Consortium decided to try to do something about this um, by developing a standard XML format for privacy policies. Uh, and this, the, this was conceived back in 1995. Um, and uh, basically the Federal Trade Commission um, uh, said to the industry, there must be something you can do about these privacy policies and make them useful to people. And uh, there was an industry group that got together with um, some consumer groups and the World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, they said, well, what could we do? And they came up with this idea of, let's have a system so people can have their browser negotiate with websites about privacy. And uh, it was mostly lawyers who came up with this initial idea. And I think they really envisioned your browser haggling with the website. You know, the website would say, hey, I want your name, address, and phone number, and I want to sell it to everybody. And your browser would say, oh, no, you can't do that. I'll tell you what, I'll give you my zip code. Is that enough? And you know, they could go back and forth. Um, the, I, I think they, some of these people really envisioned that, that that's what we were going to do. Um, and so W3C uh, adopted a working group to, to actually try to build this thing. Um, and we spent several years um, working on that larger vision of this haggling um, browser um, before we realized that it, it was um, it just wasn't going to happen, that, that there, were, there were technical reasons, but there were also policy and business reasons that it's so difficult for a company to come up with one privacy policy they can stand behind. Imagine them coming up with five that they could negotiate over. Um, you know, so for, for many reasons, the, this whole haggling thing wasn't going to happen. And so um, what we ended up with after five years um, in W3C working on this was basically uh, XML syntax for privacy policies and some uh, conventions and protocols so that we know where to actually find the policies and actually get them sent where they need to go at the right time. Um, and uh, so, so uh, W3C specified all of this, um, but the policy is still not useful unless there's some user agent that can do something useful with it. And W3C doesn't say much about user agents. They left that up for somebody else to figure out. Um, and so uh, we saw the first P3P user agents were built into IE6 and Netscape 7, um, and we, we got some, some initial um, adoption of P3P. Um, so in case you haven't seen it, this is what P3P looks like in IE6. Um, there's this little uh, eyeball with a do not enter sign uh, symbol, which I think is probably one of the um, least understood parts of IE6. I know um, often when I... When I talk to audiences, I, I ask, you know, anybody, can anybody tell me what this means? And usually nobody has any idea what it means. Some people vaguely remember having seen it. Um, some people are, swear they've never seen it, even though they use IE6. Um, the first time it appeared, there was an explanation, but, you know, that was a long time ago, and people swatted it away. Um, and then there's this uh, settings menu that lets you actually control your privacy settings. Um, and most people have no idea that that exists either. But if they do, they, they read it and they try to understand what it means. And it's fairly cryptic. So the average person doesn't know what a third party cookie is, a compact privacy policy. And then, then here's one I love that even privacy experts have trouble with. Um, what does it mean um, to do something without implicit consent? <coughs> think about that one without implicit consent. I, I, I thought about it quite a bit and then I think I asked JC, <laughs> what, what does that mean? No, no, and he said, I didn't write it, I don't know. <laughs> um, it has something to do with opt out and opt in. And, um, but the, the, anyway, uh, the point is that, that this P3P implementation here um, could, could use a lot of improvement. Um, some other things about it, if you actually click on that little eyeball thing, you get a list of all the cookies on a web page um, and what uh, IE6 decided to do with them. Um, and so in this case, there are three cookies that decided to block them. And then we can actually click on them. And if the cookies came from a P3P-enabled website, then we can get information about the privacy policy. Um, there's also a well-hidden feature in the View menu, the View Privacy Report feature. Now, has anybody in here used that feature? All right. 
<laughs> so so here, here we have you know, like one or two. Um, in a normal audience, it's zero. Um, but, but this has been in here ever since IE6 came out five years ago or whenever it was. This has been in here. Um, if you go to the View menu and you uh, select Privacy Report, what it does is it goes to the, the website. It fetches that XML privacy policy. It translates it into English, and it displays it here for you. Um, and it's, um, I'm told it's actually internationalized so that you know, if you have the French version of the browser, it displays it in French or whatever language uh, is appropriate. Um, so uh, it, th this is nice uh, that we get this automatic translation. Um, you might be able to tell from the size of the scroll bar that it's a very lengthy translation. Um, it, it's quite verbose. Um, and unfortunately, it's not 100% accurate because there's a bug in it. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and that bug's been there for five years, too. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's a nice start um, on, on a P3P user agent. Um, Netscape has something very similar. Um, instead of a slider bar, they've got the little radio buttons, but it's, it's essentially the same, same deal. Um, instead of the eyeball symbol, when, um, when the Netscape, the first version of Netscape 7 came out, they had a chocolate chip cookie. And um, the nice thing about the chocolate chip cookie is that you see it and you go, cookie, it has something to do with cookies. Um, and so that's really good because eyeballs don't have anything to do with cookies. Uh, the problem is, is that it's supposed to be a warning symbol. <laughs> and you know, unless you're like on a diet or something, you can't be too scared of a chocolate chip cookie, right? <laughs> um, so, so that wasn't too effective either. And so in subsequent releases of Netscape 7, they switched to an eyeball symbol. It's, an, it's not the same eyeball symbol as that IE has, but, but it's, it's a similar eyeball symbol. Uh, I think it's an eyeball with a, with a piece of paper instead of a do not enter sign. But, um, <laughs> But anyway, so apparently eyeballs are supposed to mean that this website has some privacy issue, but um, nobody understands that. Okay, and uh, Netscape uh, also will give you a summary of the, um, of the compact P3P policy that comes with the cookie, so it's kind of a short version of the privacy policy, so instead of that long thing that you had to scroll through the scroll bar, they give you this little short thing. They also have a way of getting the long thing, and theirs is actually in a format that's not quite as long as the IE6 one. It has nice bolded lists, but they seem to have forgotten to run it through a spell checker and a grammar checker, and so theirs is a little weird too. So um, when I was the chair of the P3P working group, um, and we saw these user agents, and we, we poked a lot of fun at them, and then we said, um, we'd like you know, something better. And, uh, and so everybody said, well, you build something better. And I was at AT&T, where we didn't have a browser. Um, but I convinced the powers that be that, that they could um, let us build um, a uh, plug-in for a browser. And so we built this uh, browser helper object um, for IE6 that would uh, be a P3P user agent. Um, and uh, when I left AT&T, they eventually uh, released this as open source, and so my students are continuing um, to work on it. So we called it Privacy Bird. Um, and um, we uh, didn't actually worry about the cookie part, because if you're using IE6, that's already handling the, uh, the blocking cookies based on P3P. What we were interested in is more of, of the informing the user about privacy part. Um, and so we have a persistent icon in the form of a bird, uh, which you can look at to um, understand a website's uh, privacy policy. So um, here you can see in the upper right-hand corner, there is our green privacy bird. And this is actually the second version. Um, so some of those, those of you who've seen privacy bird before might notice that the bird has changed. Um, but so we have, we have the green bird there, and it will tweet at us, maybe. We can't hear the sound, okay, because the sound, the sound is, um, is, is going on the uh, video, but uh, we don't have it in the room. All right, so trust me, it tweets at you. Um, we have the green happy bird. This indicates that this website matches the privacy preferences that I have set up in my browser. Um, here we have a, a site with a red angry bird that does not match the preferences that I've set up in the browser. And when I mouse over that red bird, I get that little uh, pop-up box there, which tells me exactly what the difference is between my settings and the website's policy. <coughs> okay. And if I click on the bird, I can get a summary of the privacy policy. So this is where we take the XML, translate it back into English. And we, um, when we designed this, we like to, th to think about it as a nutrition label for privacy. So we were looking for a kind of a standard format that would be really easy to see at a glance um, what the privacy practices are. 
Um, but there are a lot of privacy practices in Islong, and so what we ended up doing was having a, um, a, a uh, summary here that kind of unfolds, so you can drill down and get more detailed information. So what we did is we put at the top the reasons that the policy doesn't match our preferences, because that's probably the first thing somebody's going to want to know when they see the red bird. Um, and uh, we hyperlinked the opt-outs. So if I see it doesn't match my preferences, but this thing that I don't like, there's a way to opt out of it. All I have to do is click here, and it will take me to a page on the website that tells me about opt-out. Um, what? website has to actually provide that link. Right. So uh, in a P3P policy, if a website declares that opt-out is available, they have to provide a URL where they explain it. Now, it may not be an online opt-out. It may, it may explain, call this 800 number. But they have to at least explain how to do it um, and put that in their P3P policy. How often are those, like, set of date? Um, <laughs> uh, the, they're sometimes out of date. They're, they don't appear to be out of date as often as um, the um, email address for the chief privacy officer is out of date. <laughs> uh, that, that one seems to be out of date a lot. The, these tend to, once, once a website has put them up, they tend not to move this page around that much, but, but they're, not, they're not always up to date. Um, okay, another thing you'll see here is that the, the next thing we put is this red box that tells you how the company will share your information. And the reason we've done that is because we've done a lot of um, studies where we ask people about what they're interested um, in in privacy policies. And one of the things that, that comes up very frequently is people say, well, I want to know if the company is going to sell my information, who they're going to share it with. So we said, okay, let's pull that out and put that right up front. Okay, now if you scroll down, we get to the part where we see more detailed information about what data they collect and what they're going to do with it. Um, and then you can open up these little triangles and get even more detail where, where we can actually um, enumerate the kinds of data that's collected if they've declared that um, and have a lot more information. Okay, another thing that Privacy Bird does is it checks for embedded content. So um, uh, as you know, a web page is composed of many different objects. It has images and frames and sounds, and they're not all served from the same web server. And so there may be multiple privacy policies that actually apply to a page. And this is something that a human inspecting the page is not going to notice unless they get into view source and start looking at it very, very carefully. Um, so uh, Privacy Bird actually goes and checks all those objects, and it looks for the associated P3P policies. So in this case, we can bring up um, the, all the objects on the page, and you can see there are quite a few objects on this page, and they come from many different servers. And we've checked the privacy policies on all of those objects. And some of them matched our preferences, some of them don't match, and some of them don't have P3P policies, so it's unknown. And then you could, if you want to actually click on one of those policies and bring up the policy summary for any of those. Okay. Um, this is to show you what the privacy settings actually look like. Um, there are, are uh, many, many fields um, in the XML. And so you could have um, uh, a huge number of, of different fine-grained settings if you wanted to in P3P. Um, we initially were exploring you know, this big multidimensional matrix, and um, that wasn't going to work. So our goal here was to design an interface that, that would fit on one screen. Um, and so we could only have as many questions as would fit on one screen, which is 12. Um, in this case. Um, and uh, we found that some users liked that, and we found some users thought that 12 was still too many. So then we added low, medium, and high. And you know, if you don't want to read through any of this, you can just pick low, medium, and high. And when you pick one of those, it automatically checks the appropriate boxes. So you can actually see what low, medium, and high mean. And then if you say, oh, I like medium, but I want to add this one more, you can just go ahead and, and uh, modify that setting. Um, you can also um, import settings and export settings, so if you, if you want to take somebody else's settings. And in the import feature, you can actually adjust settings that are not on this screen, because um, there are many other fields in P3P that th these settings don't, e don't even touch. Um, but if you use, there's, um, there's a language called Appel, um, which is an XML language. If you use that, you can actually touch all the settings that way. So let me show you an example of uh, privacy bird in use. So let's say I want to uh, send flowers to my mom. Um, so I, uh, I don't normally send flowers to my mom, so I don't have a favorite florist. Um, so I go to Google, and I do a search for send flowers. And oh, 1-800-flowers.com. That looks good. So let's go to their website. And I have a red bird. The, the Google site has a yellow bird. 
Oh, yes, yes, the Google site had a yellow bird. That, that's because Google doesn't have a P3P policy. <sighs> yeah, I know. I, I've, been, I've been yelling at them for years, and they, they, they just won't Google listen. Does. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> that, that is true. Referral service that says, this is yellow, but that's green. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so MSN search does have a, a, a P3P policy, which is very good. But, but um, Google does not, and so we have the yellow bird. Um, so anyway, we get 100 flowers, and they have a red bird. And um, I, don't, I don't really like sites that don't um, follow my privacy preferences, and I especially don't want them to violate my mom's privacy, so I'm not going to um, order from 1-800-Flowers. So I go back to Google, and I run my search again. And this time, we'll try ftd.com. And we go there, and oh, they have a yellow bird, too. And I'm too lazy to go read their privacy policy. So I guess I have to go back to Google again and keep repeating, repeating. Um, and eventually, I will either give up and decide I'm just going to call my mom and forget the flowers, <laughs> or I'm going to, to order the flowers from some site, regardless of their privacy policy. Um, so there has to be a better way. And that's what um, we decided to work on. Um, so we developed a tool called Privacy Finder. And here I can uh, type my search into Privacy Finder. I can choose whether I want to run this on the Google or the Yahoo search engine. Um, the, the reason we have Google and Yahoo there is because they had their APIs exposed in a way that was very easy for us to do that. I don't know if, the, uh, if there's an API for the MSN search engine we can use. If there is, we'll be happy to add it on. <laughs> um, uh, so I can I pick my search engine, I can um, pick my preference level, and in the preference level I've got the high, medium, and low, and if I want to go and answer those 12 questions, I can actually go to the custom settings and do that here. Um, and I search, and now I get search results that are annotated with privacy information. Um, and what we do is um, we get back that first 10 search results and we reorder them so that those with the best um, privacy policies are at the top, but only within those 10. Now, what is what is flowers have three green bars? No, that's 800 floral, uh, 1 800 flowers. Um, yeah, so it has, so what, what yeah, the, the way you can interpret this is that if the, uh, it, it's a, it's a privacy o meter or something like that, or bird o meter, if we were calling it for a while. Um, so if it has all the, the uh, boxes filled in, then it's a perfect match with my settings. Here we have three out of four um, filled in. So that means it doesn't match my settings, but it's only off by a little bit. Um, and if we had, say, just four blank boxes, that would mean it completely didn't match my settings. So that means then that, going back to the example when 1-800-Flowers came up red, that doesn't mean it's a bad <coughs> policy. It just means it didn't meet your criteria. That's right. So in fact, a red bird could still be much better than many yes. yellow birds. Yes, and, and in the initial version of Privacy Finder, instead of these green boxes, we put the birds in. And I'm going to talk about a study we did. And one of the problems was that people interpreted the red bird as bad. But in fact, it, all it means is it doesn't match. And, in, and so here's a site that would get a red bird, but it actually almost matches. And it's a lot better than than other sites. In this particular search, you don't see others. But there, I, I could have done another search that would have come up with lots of sites with one green box or no green boxes. And that would be much preferable to that. So what, why the, the mismatch? It seems like we're teaching users two different things to look for. And if a meter is better than a bird here, wouldn't a meter be better than a bird? Um, yeah, well, we're, we're, so, so this is a recent change where we went to the meter. And we're going to think about going, you know, what we should do in the, um, in the other piece of software as well. But uh, yeah, and we're still actually experimenting with the meter to see whether people actually understand it. We haven't had the meter out long enough to be convinced that it's definitely the right answer, um, but it seems to be going in the right direction. Um, so in this case, I can see uh, right away, here's one that perfectly matches my privacy preferences. I can go there, and sure enough, they have a green bird, and I can order the flowers and be happy. Okay. So. Um, so as I said, this is Privacy Finder. This um, was initially developed at AT&T Labs. It was a very, very rough prototype that took, you know, like two minutes to return search results. And um, it just, it, 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 um, it didn't have preference settings. It, did, it was just sort of a, a very rough proof of concept. Um, and uh, so my students completely rewrote it. And um, uh, now it's very fast. It, you can have a choice of search engine. Um, you can, it generates privacy reports, just like Privacy Bird does. 
Um, and it's publicly available. You can actually go and try it today. How do Google and Yahoo feel about it? I, I have no idea. I mean, they, 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 have a, they have a public API, and we're, we're using it. Um, now, I, I actually, they, they must um, uh, be somewhat OK with it, because they, they did give us um, larger um, API keys than we'd normally get. Because um, normally, you, you can only um, use their API for like 50 you know, searches a day or something. And um, you know, we, we used that up pretty quickly. So we, we went back to them and said, could we have you know, 10,000 searches a day or something? And, I don't remember what they find. They didn't give us as much as we, we wanted, but they, they, they did give us a much larger key. It's um, taking out their sponsored links and things, right? So. Right, but that's how their API works. They're, they're, when you use their API, it doesn't give you the sponsored links. So. You could put their sponsored links back on your page and you start getting paid for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we've, actually, we've actually considered doing that as a way of, of raising money for the lab. Um, we, we have talked about that. Um, and we've been going back and forth. On, so on the one hand, we, we could raise some money that way. On the other hand, it's supposed to be a privacy service. And so we're, you know, we're trying to keep it really clean. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Um, no, actually, what we would really like is for um, one of these search engines to like this so much that they would want to build it into their service. Um, and so we, we're um, hopeful that some search engine out there will decide they, they really like it. Um, and so far, they, that hasn't happened. Um, so it's just running on one of our servers in our lab. Um, and it's publicly available, but we're not advertising it too much because it would obviously bring down our server if too many people used it. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the key to actually making this run fast um, turned out to be the cache. So we, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time doing performance optimization. It's a bunch of Perl scripts. and. Um, I'm, I'm sure we could optimize it a lot more than how it's currently done. Um, but what really sped it up was the cache, because before we had the cache, every time you do a search, you get back 10 results. You have to go to 10 websites and fetch their P3P policies. That takes at least three round trips, and to even to find out that they don't have a P3P policy. And so just waiting for that to happen took a long time. Um, and often it's waiting for timeouts that took a long time. Um, so by caching information about whether a website has a P3P policy, and then if so, what it is, that, that saved us a lot of time. Um, and the way the P3P spec is written, you can safely cache for 24 hours. Um, and so we, um, we just have a process that's constantly running and updating the cache. Um, and um, for a while, we were actually checking every site in our cache every 24 hours. And the thing is, sites don't add P3P policies that fast. So um, it was using lots and lots of bandwidth. Um, and our network administrators were yelling at us. And uh, so we, we decided to make it so if they don't have a P3P policy, we wait 30 days before we check again. Um, but we also have a button on the website for where uh, somebody can type in a URL and say, update the cache for this URL now. And so if a, if a company adds a P3P policy, they can do that, and we'll immediately um, update our cache for them. Um, so yeah, so we now have. Um, 18,000 P3P policies, and we have uh, 389,000 sites that we are checking. Um, and uh, how, how did we get all those sites in the cache? Um, so anytime anybody does a search, um, whatever the results are, we put in the cache. Um, but one of the studies, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we actually took 20,000 search terms and ran them to do the study. And in the process of doing the study, that built our cache. OK, so anyway, that's, that's what it looks like. And here's another search to show you an example. Um, we have the, the mouse over here um, to give you the quick information. And then you can get the whole pri privacy report here again, just like in Privacy Bird. Um, there are a bunch of new features that we're planning on uh, building. Um, so we're interested in adding uh, price comparison. And I'll, I'll show you a screenshot in a minute of, of a first version of that. Um, we're, we're still sort of refining the privacy report and trying to make that more useful for people. Um, and uh, we also, in the process of doing this, have noticed that there are a lot of websites that have errors in their P3P policies. Um, and th there are probably a lot of um, semantic errors, which we can't necessarily catch. But, uh, but there are definitely a lot of syntax errors, which we, we can very easily catch. Um, and so we're thinking about adding an interface for a system administrator to be able to see, see what their errors are in their P3P policy using this tool. Um, and we're also planning on, uh, on actually uh, collecting lists of sites with errors and contacting them and, and uh, 
seeing if we can get them to fix them and, and trying to understand the source of the errors. Do you have a PPP tool? Creation tool? No, no, we don't. Um, yeah, we, we've been using the, the uh, IBM one. So, okay, so here's uh, the first version of our um, our shopping P3P search. So here we use the uh, the Yahoo uh, shopping interface, um, and so you can see not only which sites have the best privacy policy, but also which ones have the best price as well. Okay. So now that we've built this, we want to know: is it actually useful? Um, and there's kind of four questions that we've come up with that that um, speak to whether or not it's useful. All right. So the first is. Do users care? Is this even something that people care about? Um, and uh, there seems to be a lot of survey evidence um, that people do care about privacy. Um, and so that's not the, that hasn't been the focus of our work. We're gonna we're gonna accept that from what other people have said. Um, the next question is: Are there enough websites that actually use P3P that this can be useful? Um, because if you do a search and you don't get any birds or green boxes, then you know what's the point? Um, and so I'm going to tell you about a study where we looked at that. Um, we also want to know whether people understand the information that they get back. Um, and uh, as, as I explained about you know, the misinterpreting what the red bird means, there's, there's some indication that, that some of these things need some improvement. And we, down the road, plan to do a lot more work in that area. Um, and then finally, do people do anything with this information? So if you're doing this search so that you can purchase something, do you actually change where you're going to make your purchase based on the information that this gives you. And so we're looking at that as well. All right, so I'm going to focus right now on two of these questions. OK, so website adoption of P3P. Um, this uh, is work that um, I did with uh, one of my students, Serge Egelman, and with Abdur um, Chowdhury, who is at um, America Online Search. Um, and um, what what we uh, wanted to do was to look at search, the search engine um, uh, as, as a way of understanding P3P popularity. Uh, so there have been a lot of studies in the past, including some that we've done, where you get the list of the, you know, the top 500 most popular websites, and you see if they have P3P. Um, but this doesn't show you what the typical user sees through a search engine. And since we know a lot of users start their day on the internet with the search engine, that's kind of a lens through the internet that applies to a lot of users. So we wanted to see, well, when you do a search, how many P3P policies come up? Um, so um, we got a list of 20,000 search terms that real AOL users had typed in. Um, they basically took a week's worth of search logs and randomly sampled 20,000 and gave us that list. Um, and uh, they actually had, had some, um, I think, interns at AOL categorized the 20,000 searches into a number of different categories uh, as well, which was nice. Um, then we used the, uh, the Frugal um, search engine where they list on the front page recent searches, and we screen scraped that for a while um, until we got almost 1,000 um, search terms off of that. Um, and so we had two terms. We, we, we uh, called the AOL terms our typical search terms, and the other ones were our e-commerce search terms. Because we know if you're doing a Frugal search, you want to buy something. Um, so then we took all the search terms and we submitted them to the Google, Yahoo, and AOL search engines. And we collected the top 20 results that each of those search engines returned. Now the AOL search engine actually is the Google search engine, um, or it's powered by Google, but it gets slightly different results, um, interestingly. Um, then we came up with a, a set of five uh, P3P rule sets, which you could think of as different, different sets of privacy preferences that somebody might have. And we ran all the P3P policies that we discovered um, among those search results against those five rule sets. Um, and then we saved um, our annotated search results in a database. And then separately, um, AOL gave us the 30,000 domains that were most often clicked on from the AOL search engine. And we did, we, uh, did the same thing um, with those domains. OK, so here's what we found as far as the overall deployment. Um, of all the sites that were now in our database after having, having done all this, we found that 10% of them have uh, P3P, or 10% of the typical sites have, have, have P3P. Um, but the e-commerce search terms led us to um, sites that were twice as likely to have P3P. Uh, so that indicates that 
that um, among sites that people actually shop at, they're more likely to have P3P than just the average random site on the internet. Um, okay, we also saw that the more popular a site is, the more likely it is to have P3P. Um, so if you look at all of the sites in our cache, um, overall, um, about 5% of them have P3P. But if you start looking at the most popular sites, you see that you know, the, you know, the top 10 most popular sites, about a third of them have P3P. And you can see that this kind of levels off uh, down a little bit ab above, um, well, this is the top 30,000, so I think that levels off around 8% there. Okay. All right, um, so to give you an idea of who has P3P policies, so we looked at um, the sites that came up the most times in search results um, using the typical terms and the e-commerce terms, um, and so these are the ones that had P3P. Um, you can see that, that Yahoo um, is the absolute top um, most popular site with P3P, no matter how you slice it. Um, part of the reason for that is that uh, Yahoo is popular, but part of the reason for that is that the Yahoo privacy policy goes on all Yahoo hosted sites. And so there are a lot of businesses that are hosted by Yahoo, and instead of seeing the business's P3P policy, you see Yahoo's P3P policy, um, something which I'm not so sure is a good thing, but um, that's the way it is. Um, uh, you can see there are a few government websites. The National Library of Medicine comes up uh, pretty frequently because when people do health ser searches, NLM is often in the uh, search results. Okay, so using the uh, categories that the AOL interns did for us, um, we looked to see um, whether there are certain categories of sites that had more P3P policies. Yeah? yeah um, do bad guys have P3 policies, like spammers, affiliates, and things like this? Yeah, some of them do. So what is it? All it means is that if you can find them, you can sue them for fraud if, if they violate it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ha you can have a P3P policy that says, you know, we have a terrible privacy policy. Um, you could also have a P3P policy that says we have a great, great privacy policy, and they lie. Um, but then you have, have to find them, and you have to. Yeah, them. and that's the same way with the written privacy policies as well. So, um, so do you find much evidence that that's going on? Um, no, we find a lot of evidence that people put up P3P policies and forget about them and don't change them when they change their privacy policies, but we haven't found a lot of evidence of people maliciously misleading in the first place. Um, okay, so this is the distribution. So you can see that shopping is the most likely to have a P3P policy and pornography is actually not very likely to have <laughs> P3P policy and everything else falls in between. Um, okay, so we also looked at, if I run a search, how likely am I to find a P3P hit in my top 10 or top 20 search results? So if I look at the top 20 search results, 83% um, of the time I'm going to find at least one uh, site that has a P3P policy. And if I look only at the top 10 results, 68% of the time I'm going to find it. Um, and, and that's in the, the typical uh, searches. Um, Looking again at the typical searches in the top uh, 20 search results, right, if I, let's say I'm not happy just finding a site with a P3P policy. I want a site with a good P3P policy. Well, good is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but we decided to take um, the medium privacy setting from Privacy Bird and say we'll call that good. Um, so we find that about a third of the time when I do a search, I will get back at least one site that has a good P3P policy. All right. Well, what if I, I don't like that, that medium privacy setting. Instead, what I really want to know is the site is not going to share my personal data without my explicit consent. All right. So again, it comes up about a third of the time I find that. Okay. Well, what if I don't care about sharing? What I'm worried about is marketing. Again, about a third of the time I can find that. Um, and so therefore, we, we came to the conclusion that with Privacy Bird today, or actually a few months ago, um, about a third of the time an AOL user running a typical search would be able to find a site with a good privacy policy. Right. We we'd like this number to be higher, obviously. A third of the time isn't that great, but it's enough that I think we're starting to have a critical mass of sites that this tool is beginning to become useful. But that's not a third of the sites that and have a policy. No. A third of all sites. No, no, this is a third of the time when I run a search I will find at least one site in 
the top 20 search results. Not, be, not that a third of the search results have it. But, um, but it could be that they don't have a, a policy at all. Right. Right. Yeah. So as I said, we, we'd really like these numbers to be a lot higher, um, but we're starting to get there. Okay. Um, how could these numbers get higher? Uh, well, it turns out that there are a small number of popular sites that actually account for a lot of web traffic and a lot of search results. So if Amazon would adopt P3P, um, okay, that would give us an almost a 1% boost just, just for Amazon adopting P3P. Um, and uh, we're, we're already getting a boost from U.S. government sites um, because U.S. government sites are actually required to have P3P, but only 39% of them do. Um, and actually the military ones are even worse. Um, but this is better than um, three years ago when we did a, a similar study and we found that only 5% of them had it. So yeah, they're, they're, they're catching on slowly. Um, what I think would really uh, boost adoption, though, was that if a major search engine actually offered the service, that would be a big incentive for websites to adopt P3P. OK, so now switching a little to um, whether this is actually influencing user behavior. So uh, we have a paper on this that uh, we presented last week at the uh, SOUPS conference. And there's Sarah's presenting it. Um, and we also had a, a poster related to it. And Janice and Sarah's are, um, are presenting their poster there. OK. Um, so we did an online shopping study. And we, we put up flyers around campus and said, you know, get paid to do an online shopping study. Um, and we got 24 um, students who participated. Um, and we had them make purchases using their own credit cards because we wanted the personal information that was at stake to really be their personal information. Um, and uh, we reimbursed them for all the purchases they made during our study. And we gave them an extra $10 for participating. And there were three phases. First, we had um, the screening survey, we did a lab experiment, and then we had an exit survey. Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, all right, so <laughs> we started with the screening survey, um, uh, where we, besides screening them to make sure they were actually eligible to participate, we wanted to find out up front what were their privacy concerns. Um, and so we got a lot of data on what their concerns were, and we wanted to match that with what information Privacy Finder actually provides to see whether Privacy Finder even addressed the kinds of concerns that people said they had. Um, okay, the, the laboratory experiment. Um, we. Uh, what, you said that you did not include people who didn't have minimal privacy concerns. What percentage of the Oh, it was a it was a very small number of people who were excluded. Yeah, almost. I think all but one of the pers people who did the screening survey had, and we did find minimal as. Um, so we asked them about twenty different areas of privacy, and if they said anything above, I don't care, <laughs> we said they have a minimal privacy concern. And and I think yeah, there was only one person who just didn't care about any of these things. Um, OK, so we, we took the uh, Privacy Finder interface. And this was the old interface that had birds, not the green boxes. And I'll show it to you again in a minute. Um, and we, we took off the word privacy, and we, we called it Shopping Finder. So it would be a neutral thing. Um, but we told them that these birds would indicate about privacy policies. We gave them a little bit of information about that. And half of the students um, used that interface. And half of the students used the identical interface, but no birds. So they didn't get any privacy information. Um, and we first asked them to uh, purchase um, uh, a, a uh, typical um, household or business item, a, a surge protector, six outlet surge protector. Um, and then we wanted them to purchase a more privacy sensitive item. So we had them um, uh, purchase a box of condoms. Um, and we wanted to see whether you know, ha there was a difference based on the type of item that was purchased. Um, and we said that if they wanted to, they could ship the items to themselves and keep them, or they could ship them to the lab. <laughs> uh, so this is what the, um, the interface uh, looked like that they saw. So you can see we've got the, the uh, birds here. We did not reorder the search results here. Um, as in the previous interface. So whatever um, order they came up, that's what they got. But we did hard code it so that everybody would see the same results. Because um, you know, if you do a search and then two hours later you do the same search, you may get different results. Um, okay. um, the medium preference level was also hard coded in. They didn't get to choose their preference level. Why was there no bird on one? Uh, because those sites did not have any P3P policies. And instead of putting a yellow bird, we just left the bird off. 
Um, so this was the, the, the preference setting that was hard coded in. So if any of these were violated, they would see a red bird. Any one violation would cause a red bird instead of a green bird. Um, so basically, if the uh, site was collecting health or medical information and was going to do marketing or share it, um, if they don't allow an opt out of marketing, um, uh, if they're going to share PII, um, and if they don't have an access provision, those, those were all things that could trigger a red bird. Now we're going to, let's try that again. Okay, we'll come, yeah, okay. That's where I wanted to be. All right, so um, these are the products that got shipped to the lab. So. <laughs> if people wanted to keep the surge protectors, I don't know. Um, we, we've done a, a subsequent survey, which I'm, uh, a subsequent study, which I'm not going to have time to talk about too much today, and my students chose for that one to have people buy pens and personal lubricant. <laughs> and I have stacks of bottles of personal lubricant sitting in my office, which makes people really wonder. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, so um, after they did this shopping uh, experiment, we had an e exit survey where we tried to find out from, um, from them uh, what, what went into their um, decision to, to make the purchases at the different websites. Um, we also wanted to find out about what privacy c concerns they had when making the purchases, um, and we um, collected demographic information. And then from the people in the experimental group, we also asked them whether they read the privacy reports um, and what understanding they had about the bird. So what do you think a green bird actually meant? Um, Okay, so looking at the e-commerce privacy concerns. So this was gathered from all three phases of the study, from the initial screening survey, during the experiment, and from the exit survey. Um, but what kept coming up were that people were concerned about their information being shared um, with other companies. Um, they were concerned about unsolicited marketing, especially telemarketing. And they were concerned about not being able to get off lists once they were on them, uh, so a lack of opt-out. Um, so th th this seems to really be the three big things that pe three big concerns people have um, when uh, making online purchases. Um, and uh, we were pleased that these, in fact, were concerns that Privacy Finder addresses. Um, we also saw that in the condom purchase case, there were some additional concerns that came up only in that case, and that was the discrete packaging when the item arrived, um, information about who would have access to their order history, and what kind of information would actually show up on their credit card statement. Um, these are things that, um, that don't really get addressed by Privacy Finder. Um, the order history sort of gets addressed, but the other two do not. Okay. Um, so we found that the privacy indicators do, in fact, influence purchases. Um, so that, that was uh, encouraging. Um, and we saw the biggest impact for um, the condom purchases. There, there was a much bigger impact there than for the power strip purchases. Um, however, when we asked people about what uh, influenced their decisions, although they said that the, in the privacy indicator was um, one factor, price was the biggest factor. Um, although they had no price incentive because we were going to reimburse them no matter how much they spent. Um, so it was interesting to see that they still um, thought that they should save money even though we told them they could buy whatever they wanted. Um, and, uh, but the amount of money that we're talking about here wasn't huge. That you know, the difference in price of a box of condoms from one website to the other is not that, that big a difference in price. Um, so we want to do future studies that are going to follow up on this price issue. So give them, yeah, right, by, by thinking what their reward is based on yeah. an expense of the Give them a certain and, amount of money and they must purchase this. Yeah, so, so actually in, in, yeah, in the personal lube study, we actually did that, yeah. Um, and and we, we have more, more ideas of how to do this. So just, just to show you some of the data, um, so looking at the power strips, um, so the control group, which didn't see any birds, um, so they had no idea what the privacy settings were unless they actually read the privacy policy, which nobody did. Um, you can see how that came out. And then the experimental group, you could see that people were much more likely to actually go to a green bird site. Or actually, I shouldn't say much more. They were somewhat more likely. It wasn't a, a strong statistical finding there. Um, yeah. The, the no bird is, is, is higher. Like the, it's um, yeah, and I'll get to that in a minute as to why that is. Um, 
Uh, so you can see with the um, condoms, we had uh, more people looking for green birds here. Um, and uh, although we still have uh, a number of people who go with no bird. Um, and this was part of the misunderstanding of the birds, that a lot of people felt that what they should be doing is avoiding red birds, and that a no bird was going to be better than a red bird. Okay. Um, we also asked them about the privacy reports. Um, so we found, unfortunately, um, a third of the people couldn't actually find the privacy report. You had to click on the bird to get it. So in the, our subsequent revision of the interface, we actually have a link that says privacy report. Um, so hopefully people will be able to find it now. Um, and there were some people who just weren't interested in reading them. Um, as I said, the, the bird symbol was somewhat confusing. We also asked people, what do you think a green bird means? And half of them thought it meant that the site used encryption. Okay. We, never, we never even mentioned the word encryption to them at any time during the study. Um, so that was just they thought of that. Um, and so again, it, it goes to there, there's some communication that's not um, going through 100%. Okay. Um, so uh, we have uh, a lot more we want to do in this area. Um, we, we have um, uh, submitted uh, grant proposals where we've outlined um, a whole series of studies. Um, one of the things we want to do is, is better control for a number of the factors. So we want to better control for price. Um, we want to do studies with um, multiple purchases where we can have the same number of good sites and bad sites across purchases. So in this case, we had more sites that had privacy birds at all with the condom purchase than with the power strip purchase, right, which made it not entirely comparable. So we want to be able to better control for these sorts of things. Um, we also, we gave them a specific brand of condom, but we didn't give them a specific brand of power strip. And so in the power strip purchase, there are some people who may have said, oh, well, this one has a 10-foot cord and this one has a 15-foot cord. That may have been you know, a factor. We want to be able to control for that as well. So we learned a lot of things that we should be able to control for better in the future. Um, we also want to maintain click logs so we can see uh, whether people are reading privacy policies, whether they're looking at return policies, you know, what else they might be looking at. We'd actually intended to do that in this study, and um, there was a bug in our software that a last minute change introduced, and so we, at the end we go, oh, wait a minute, our logs aren't there. Yeah. Another thing that might be interesting to control for is um, whether somebody might purchase this online or not. So, for example, if I'm, it might be that, that if I'm going to buy condoms, I'm only going to go to a drugstore in a part of town that I never otherwise would right. go to. Um, and so I never would go out there, but then yes, I'm going to be very sensitive if in, the, in, the, in the experiment. Uh, whereas anything that I would get online, I'm not going to, so, so that's Yeah, good. yeah, and, and part, we'd like to have a lot more participants, and if we did that, then we would be able to divide it according to whether people told us they would. We did ask them, you know, is this something you've ever bought online before and things like that. But we didn't have enough participants that we could even, you know, analyze the data right. that way. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, but I guess you could ask them whether they might, you know, in advance yeah. give them a list yeah, of, the of things that you might or might not be right. willing to buy right. online. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, actually, we want to do that also because we want to come up with a list of, of sensitive things and we want to find things that make people uncomfortable but not so uncomfortable that they refuse to participate in the study. So we were actually worried in both of these studies that we'd have people who would come in and when they found out what they had to purchase would take their $10 and go. Um, but no, they all did it. But they're college students, so I guess. Uh, um, so they were, willing to, they were willing to purchase condoms and they were willing to purchase organic raspberry personal lubricant. Um, you know. <laughs> so uh, at least college students will do that. Obviously, we, we'd like to also try this not on college students. Um, <laughs> Uh, as well, so so we, we we do plan to do a survey where we ask people about um, items that might make them uncomfortable to kind of figure out what are good items to to run these tests on, as well. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, we also are looking at the the problem of the misleading um, indicator. Um, so in in the last study that we did, um, we, we used the green boxes, um, but our control group instead of having no indicator, they also had green boxes. We just didn't tell them what they meant. Um, and we found that, in fact, a lot of people really liked the green boxes, even though they had no idea what they meant, um, which um, in some ways is kind of depressing. <laughs> it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with privacy. It was just those happy green birds that made them want to go to that site. Um, 
So we, we need to drill down on that a bit more. I um, also want to look at price sensitivity. Um, and then the final thing we'd like to do is an experiment in the wild. Um, because uh, even though we're having people use their real credit cards, they're still not in a normal situation. They still may be purchasing things they don't normally purchase or in a way that, you know, that, that's not how I would do it. And so they're not in the same kind of mental state that they would be if they were really at their own computers and making purchases. So figuring out how to set up an experiment in the wild is somewhat difficult, um, but we, um, we are uh, in the process of trying to set something up with an ISP that um, has at least tentatively agreed to, um, to put the Privacy Finder interface um, in their system for a fraction of their customers. Um, and then to give us all the clicks of the search engine for a two week period. So we'll be able to compare the search behavior of the customers who have Privacy Finder with the customers who don't have Privacy Finder and be able to, to therefore compare whether we're seeing different trends as far as which websites people go to after conducting searches. Um, so that will be really cool if we can get this data and we're, we're hoping in the next few months to have that actually all set up. What is the ISP telling its customers about um, this? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> uh, so, so apparently uh, in, in their um, customer agreement, they have said that they can experiment on their customers at will. Um, apparently most ISPs do if you read the fine print of the agreement, and it turns out. Um, and so yeah. um, they, they are, um, they're not actually going to give us any PII. They're, 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 gonna, they're just going to give us the clicks with a pseudonymous um, identifier. We do the same thing. We obfuscate the data for the PII. And are you with MSN? I'm with services, yeah. so like um, uh, similar for the business side. But yeah, well, most ISPs do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, so we we, we will have um, data that won't have any personal information in it, um, and the uh, the customers are going to see. Oh, look, there's some new icons on my screen. Now, what the thing I don't know is because it, it's a random group of customers who are going to see this. You know, if their neighbor like has the same ISP but you know doesn't see it, you know, they're going to say, "Hey, I've got these new green boxes." And they go, "What green boxes?" I, I that I don't know, but they they claim they do these studies all the time and it works, and so we, we shall see. Um, but it, 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 I see it as kind of a unique opportunity to get this kind of in the wild data to to see yeah. whether this actually influences. Yeah, well, you, you know, you, each time I go in, sometimes you go in, you get totally different. A few minutes later, you get a totally different site. So there, it's not just the ISPs. I mean, you see a lot of experiments. Yeah, and I, I know Amazon does this a lot, also. So please don't be consistent. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, and I think that's yeah, that's it. All right. No. So any questions? Gloria? Yeah. Do you have any feeling for how many of your sites from your search terms and so forth are in the EU? Because in the EU, there's not the same pressure for privacy policies because you get a, de a fair <coughs> sort of medium level default anyway. Well, so actually in the EU, they're required to have privacy policies, but there's no pressure for P3P. Because part of the, um, the EU um, legislation says that you have to provide people with um, with uh, notice about the data that you're collecting. So this requires websites to have privacy policies. Um, but <laughs> they, they don't necessarily label it as such. And in some cases, instead of having one policy, at the point where the data is collected, they'll say, OK, here we're collecting this information. This is what we're going to do with it. And then some other part of the site, they'll do something else. But they have something like a privacy policy. Um, they don't necessarily have any incentive, though, to have P3P. Um, and one of the things that, that we're going to be doing, since some of the sites that come up in English language search terms are not in the US, um, so we have those sites in our database. And, and we do plan to um, do some analysis by, um, by country. It, I mean, we don't know 100% because now .com is used all over the world. But if there is a country code, we can definitely analyze that. Um, and we also want to break it down more by industry sector. So we want to get lists of, of companies in certain sectors and then run our database against those lists in order to see um, uh, are there particular sectors within e-commerce e that, um, that have more P3P or less P3P and whatnot. Yeah. How is the jurisdiction defined? Is it where the uh, service is hosted or where the business is incorporated? Or? 
all of the above. Right. So you can't even use the IP or anything to try to really figure out where the jurisdiction yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, we can use it as a proxy. Yeah, it's to a give surrogate, us a, maybe, yeah. Yeah, to give us a, a general idea, but yeah. Um, uh, and there are companies that are multinational that have, a, have different privacy policies depending on which website you go to. Yeah. So Dell actually has, I think, 25 P3P policies um, for each of the... Depending on, on the target URL? Or? Um, yeah, so when, when you go... So if you look at the English privacy policy on the Dell website, or I haven't looked at it in a while, but last time I looked, you click on the privacy policy link and it says, what country do you live in? And it gives you a list of like 25 different countries and you pick now, that one. Now Dell has an enormous set of URLs and presumably not every web page has a link to a privacy policy. Um, How do you find the privacy policy from a URL? Um, most big companies have it set up so that every web page does have a link to the privacy policy. They put it in the standard footer on the... Okay. Or big companies tend to do that. There may be some very practical ways to do something that's a lot simpler than privacy finder. Maybe if we have a chance, we can talk offline. Okay, great. Yeah. So, the, in the in, in the wild side, you're going to do what is the how is the ISP going to expose the, the interface to the user? Right? It's not just a question of gathering data; they have to somehow. Are they going to give them a plugin, or what are they going to do? Um, so, uh, when people do a search using the search engine on the ISP site, as opposed to you going to Google, but if you just use yeah. the, so you know, if you imagine it was MSM, if you used MSN search, then for those users, you get the extra privacy annotations. How many ISPs have been on search? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully when we write the paper and, and you'll be able to find out who it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mentioned this before, but I'm, I'm very concerned about the two distinct and contradictory methods of presenting the privacy data to the user, the bird and the meter. Yeah. And this seems crucial because they, they actually contradict each other to a large extent. Well, but most users are not going to see both. Uh, okay, but they're seeing both now. No, no. The... no so, so when we run the study, we don't actually give them a browser that has privacy bird in it. We're just having them do the search engine. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Privacy Bird um, is you know it's a free download and it's been downloaded by like fifty thousand people in the entire world. So mo most people, <laughs> I mean that's a lot of people, but it's not a lot of people, right? Um, so so yeah, most pe most people won't won't see both. Yeah. Okay. But I, uh, are your studies going to focus on which method is better? Because yeah. So one of the things we want to do is, is is look at the icon, um, and another thing we want to look at is the idea of putting the icon in the browser versus in the search engine. You know, we think it's better in the search engine for when, when you're searching than to have it in the browser, but we'd like to actually test that in the study as well. Thank you.